Hey folks, how's it going? Thank you for joining us. My name is Alex Lavage. I am a small business owner here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Since I've moved here in 2013, I've been very involved in building the entrepreneurial community here, like so many other hardworking Chattanoogans, to make this one of the most entrepreneurially friendly cities in the Southeast. But one of the things that I've noticed over the past few years is that sometimes when we have conversations about how we can make the community better is we don't always uh, take the time out to ask the real world entrepreneurs that are on the ground floor with boots on the ground trying to figure out how they can make their startup successful and profitable, not just for themselves, but so that ultimately they can bring in fresh capital into the region, they can create jobs. And then hopefully, speaking for myself, and I'll let the other entrepreneurs speak for themselves as well, to have that abundance so they can then invest back into the community towards the causes, nonprofits, and charities that we all care about so that we can make sure that we're making Chattanooga not just better for ourselves, but also each other. With that, we were going to have one panelist joining us shortly, but let's go around and just do quick introductions. Uh, Aaron, um, Talk a little bit about who you are, what you're working on now, and maybe a little bit about your history as well uh, within the next minute or two. Because uh, I remember when we first met at 48 Hour Launch, a successful yeah. startup came out of that. <laughs> that, was um, a, that was a minute. <laughs> that, was, that was a minute, but uh, you've got the floor. So uh, my name is Aaron Wolch. I am, am a six-time founder here in Chattanooga. Um, currently working on Whirly. We went through Techstars Austin in 2019. Um, did not find a huge amount of success post-program. We hung out in Austin and then made our way back to Chattanooga. Um, and then I worked at a local startup for approximately a year. And now I'm going back into refocus on Whirly. And so what we've essentially learned throughout COVID, as well as my years and years of experience as being an entrepreneur and a consultant is it's very difficult to find the things you need locally when Amazon just is, it's too slow. And so the other thing is how do you find used items when you need it fast? And so we're going to build a marketplace that allows that to become way easier. Um, I'm just supremely frustrated with all the options we currently have. So that is what my current project is uh, as well as a tiny house company, but we'll leave that one for another day. Cool. And then, so my history, uh, you know, I've run, I've, I've done pretty much everything that the Chattanooga entrepreneur community offers as far as programs go. I went through Gig Tank. Um, Alex mentioned 48 hour launch. I uh, started a company called Butler B, which eventually became Quick Q out of 48 hour launch. Um, and, later and so uh, we in 2013 uh, sold to Open Table for. What at the time was eleven and a half million, but eventually became thirteen and a half million, courtesy of stock options. And since then, I've done Gig Tank. Um, I've been through co starters and the various programs that are offered at the CoLab. I've mentored people and still today help out with Hamilton County Department of Education with their technology courses as well as the entrepreneurial things. Um, my real passion at this point is to share with people the mistakes that I've made because I've made a lot. And some of these are because we're not educated about the things we don't know that we don't know. And the only way to know those things is to see it in others or to be told these things are ahead of you. So Definitely. that is what I've been focusing on a lot here lately, lately is sharing that knowledge. I really appreciate you, you, you being here to share some of that. Uh, we'll join here also by Chris Cummings, who we'll get to in a second. Uh, glad you're able to be with us, Chris. Errol, you've got the floor. Hey, how's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Errol Wynn. I'm the founder of Hashtag Mall. Uh, we are a mobile shopping center, um, a hub for commerce and connectivity between small market businesses and on-the-go shoppers. Um, the thing around, this is probably, this is my second uh, technology company growing here in Chattanooga. Um, and also I had a restaurant probably about two years ago. So I've been definitely thor thoroughly immersed uh, an entrepreneurial um, cycle here at Chattanooga. Um, and kind of where it came from is where um, earlier when I got done with school, probably in 2011, I went back to Atlanta. And, you know, just hearing about, you know, 
the Chattanooga community and I wanted to get into technology. And that's where I created my uh, first technology kind of business plan around what I want to create. And so I uh, invested the time in coming back to Chattanooga. Um, I had a couple of mentors, um, some kind of people that, that extended their hand while I was there, um, persuaded me to come here um, and, and, and kind of gave me kind of the keys into to meeting the right people, building the right relationships up on early. And so um, that actually propelled me. Um, and that's actually towards the first time me and Alex met um, in meeting in collab uh, very early on um, a couple of years ago, probably about six years ago, if I'm not correct. Um, and great. so um, ever since then, uh, we met when I was inside of the uh, actual accelerator uh, for the company lab. Um, for my company at the time called Exposure, um, a digital company, um, digital display company, trying to display um, uh, kind of what drivers wanted to say, uh, kind of a solution to road rage, uh, uh, in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> I so, sure remember that. Really glad you're, you're here with us. I'm going to say real fast, since I know you all, you all, you won't take this personally. Uh, as we uh, continue, um, I may cut you off after a minute or two because we've got a lot of questions that we want to go through on the call and also leave it open too. we've got a few people joining us. So we have them uh, with an opportunity to ask questions as well. Chris, you've got the floor. Hey, everybody. My apologies for being late. I cannot translate time zones to save my life. It is a well-known problem. Uh, my name is Chris Cummings. I am founder and CEO of Pass It Down. We are a digital storytelling platform that cultural institutions like libraries, museums, and universities and brands license to be able to create uh, interactive online and touchscreen exhibits. So really, the focus of our work is all around visitor experience and visitor engagement and trying to create uh, experiences that are going to capture a new generation of visitors that are really addicted to their phones. Awesome. Um, really glad you all are here. Let's just delve right in. I'm going to kick off with the first question. Um, and if you all could each take about a minute to answer, starting with you, Chris, mm -hmm. what was it about Chattanooga initially that inspired you to launch uh, your technology startup here in our city? Yeah, absolutely. So I think to build a good company, you've got to be able to surround yourselves with other people that are building uh, great companies as well. Um, that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationship and those those uh, networks really do matter. And so um, at the time, I was living in a different location, and uh, I'd worked in a, in a B2B SaaS startup before uh, that, that we'd grown, and uh, I love B2B, I love SaaS. And I realized I was in the wrong place at the wrong time to start it because no one knew what B2B SaaS meant. They, uh, I might as well have been talking about aliens. And so, um, you know, Chattanooga to me was a balance of all the things I love. It was in the South, which I have an appreciation for. I hate cold weather. Um, and uh, I think there's something unique about Southern culture. Uh, it was striving to be a place where they made it very easy to get started, meaning that they kept... Uh, everything affordable. They were providing a lot of resources to companies right when they were getting started. And that's really important as you are, you know, seeking to to start something because whatever you start is never going to be right. You're going to need to be able to have time to learn and iterate and go through the whole customer discovery process. And so Chattanooga makes it a very affordable place to do so while also providing you with resources to help you through that. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Errol. I'm sorry. You're fine. The, the The initial question is what What was it about Chattanooga that inspired you uh, to to stay here to launch Hashtag Mall? Yes. Um, so, uh, like I said earlier, um, it, it was the the galvanizing spirit of the city uh, when it came to uh, startup companies and launching products. Um, that's what I heard initially. And um, I was already a person that um, kind of built some relationships here. And so um, walked into the right doors. And the biggest thing for me was the aspect of, um, of, of actually uh, getting the right knowledge. And so I actually started when I first came here was I, was, I had to, wanted to learn how to code. So I uh, enrolled at the, at the local uh, university, um, but getting around uh, self-taught engineers um, actually uh, got me to the point to where I actually stepped out of school to actually become self-taught, 
learn the technology. And I actually did that in, in a lot a lot less time. And I would never have done that, been able to step out on that awesome. if I wasn't around uh, Beast. And that's how they were explained to me um, by by Mike, which was the CEO of uh, Colab at the time, was if you want to learn how to code and by technology, you need to get around the beast that are in in that industry. And so um, just those relationships sparked uh, me to uh, just be here. And, and that's just an example of the community aspect. And that's why I continue to launch my startup here. I love it. Aaron. <laughs> I, I guess I have a, a little bit weirder history because I was here like right at the inception. I worked at the first ever startup at ST3 all the way back in 1999. That was our first ever big quote unquote billion dollar unicorn attempt. And then since then, I've just kind of bounced through programs. I, we didn't, we didn't have startup week. We had essentially, a it was like a geek event that happened every year. It was like code Chattanooga. And so that kind of rolled up into what eventually became 48 hour launch was a component of that. And then the 48 hour launch became its own thing. And then it create here. And so, for me, it wasn't so much that I came here because of the entrepreneurial community. I was here when Sheldon and Enoch and you know eventually you and Charlie and all of these people were building it. And so I got to see it kind of go from being this, hey, this is neat, kind of cool thing to really get the structure behind it and see the support of the community, to see the Chattanooga Renaissance Fund get started, to see Blank Slate get started. And so... For me, Chattanooga is my home. I grew up here. Um, I had the advantage of working all over the world as a consultant. So when I came back here, I had a completely different perspective and an appreciation for the town. Um, and it's been interesting to watch the kind of the evolution and, of course, recently the de-evolution of the entrepreneurial community and kind of that energy of the entrepreneurial spirit. Absolutely. I'll also just share real fast before this panel, um, I, I asked on Facebook and made some calls to some female friends who are tech founders. I know um, all of us are on the same page that, you know, we, we welcome collaboration with female uh, technology founders uh, as much as men as well. And that um, because of the, the short uh, time window I had, I was not able to put as much uh, attention towards finding someone, although just I just wanted to publicly state I did make an attempt <laughs> because the whole spirit of this forum is to have as much diversity and representation at the table and to give a shout out to your point, Aaron, how much this community has evolved. We even have a female led uh, angel investment group known as the Jump Fund. Uh, I know a lot of us have friends over there as well, and they're doing an amazing job as female entrepreneurs, also empowering female founders as well. So I'm hoping that as we do this in the future, we can continue to expand this conversation with, again, real world entrepreneurs like the three of you, boots on the ground, not just economic development leaders, not just professors in academia, not just politicians, not just people who are very prominent entrepreneurs to whom we show so much gratitude. But at the same time, when we're talking about how to improve the entrepreneurial community here, it really helps to take the time out to listen to the entrepreneurs who are still boots on the ground actually doing it, rather than those that have made it or those that are far removed. So with that question, let's, let's get into something uh, that I know is also equally as near and dear to all of our hearts is that we're not just talking about boosting up Chattanooga to saying this is a great place to launch a company, but also Chattanooga has got some challenges as well at a broad level before we delve in a little bit more technical, because I want us to keep this conversation separate between um, eventually as we talk about the problems, we're also going to come up and brainstorm some ideas for solutions, specifically what are some innovation, innovative ideas for both the public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector. But for right now, starting with you, Chris, what's been the number one bottleneck, the number one barrier to your success, having come from Chattanooga, um, that, that you felt, gosh, if only I could have gotten over that hump, launching this company would have been a little bit easier. 
Yeah, I mean, for us, uh, 100%, it was uh, access to capital. Um, as we were launching the company, we started to generate uh, a lot of success and, uh, you know, everything from business traction to we won a couple of national pitch contests. Um, and uh, and so as we were gaining the success and looking to raise a round of funding and we were looking out into the community, we were just having a very hard time at locally being able to find uh, potential investors. Um and, uh, you know, it took us getting into Techstars Austin, going through the Techstars program, and, uh, and then looking in other parts of the country. And uh, I ended up, you know, actually moving my, my headquarters out of Chattanooga. Um, and two months after that moment, we raised close to a million dollars just like that. And so, um, you know, I think for us, it was just this sense that, you know, being able to gain uh, funding was so much easier the moment that we we went out to some larger networks and they're like, no, all your all your traction is right on. This is a really good sign. Um, but it just felt like we were we were having some hurdles locally, and that was very very frustrating because Chattanooga does so much right, um, you know. And like I would say, like those these like early like first to three years uh, of starting a company, but you have to be able to have a pathway uh, to to capital. Although Alex, I know you and I have different different viewpoints sometimes on on the approach to do that. Well, and 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 we can delve into that. I think I think a healthy entrepreneurial community has both seed stage capital, but also encourages everyday citizens to build personal wealth, so Agreed. that they can then afford to do campaigns where they're able to uh, get their customers or clients to put in deposits or pre orders. And then from there, it allows more opportunities to, in some cases, not give up private equity in your company, but instead get AR financing. So I'm a fan of it all. Ultimately, I think I and so many others in this entrepreneurial community just want to see everyone be successful and for there to be a path of least resistance as they're getting their vision off the ground. Errol, you're next. And in fairness, uh, Chris has already taken access to capital, so you're not allowed to say that again. (laughs) It's got to be a different bottleneck. Okay, well, um, you, you took the leader away, so so we'll go. <laughs> um, Errol, Errol, you do what you want, okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, it would be uh, strategic partnerships, um, and so um, the next thing um, that we look for on the other side of capital is meeting the right individuals that can can help us connect the dots, um, um, and also. Um, uh, being able to attract uh, advisors, uh, individuals that we can bring into our organization to help us build on our organization. Um, we have had a, a kind of a tough time doing that here. Um, and we have gotten a lot of support. Yes, we have. Um, but, you know, as an advisor, you know, you offer uh, more, uh, more support um, than just the, the typical mentor role. And it's more focused uh, uh, to what's needed for the organization. Um, um, instead, our organization being a mobile commerce uh, organization. And so um, that was one of the things that we are uh, still trying to build upon. Um, we just got to the point to where, um, and let me be clear, everything has been bootstrapped. Uh, uh, we our plan uh, actually three years ago. And okay. so we spent some time doing some R&D um, and then had that transition to um, we fell in and out of being able to get different developers to create it. And, and through all that trial and error, we finally was able to start to get the platform created. And now we're in the final stages of that. But throughout this whole phase, we're still looking for um, um, supportive uh, advisors and, and, and to build upon more strategic relationships. Um, and that's just been one thing that has been um, um, pretty tough. So just having that access to um, that social capital and those relationships to help you, you know, guide through. Um, hopefully, ideally from people who know what they're doing and who have done it uh, makes a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, again, same criteria if you can. You're not allowed to use Errol's point or Chris's oh, point. Oh, no. Oh, I'm, I'm good at this. Um, I just, that was one of the things I'm known for is being able to pick apart the things that Chattanooga does wrong. <laughs> um, so... To there's something I want to do to bookend Chris and Errol's thing because I think there's a missing gap. But 
the one thing that's very difficult that will play also into what Errol had is attracting the right employees to Chattanooga who are willing to work for a startup. You get a lot of people here in Chattanooga who are willing to put in a little time at a lower cost, but they may not necessarily be the best coder or the most experienced person to do those jobs. But the people who are experienced in those jobs work for um, things like Carbon 5 and so on and so forth, who are based out of San Francisco or D.C. or New York, and they make the income or charge the rate of those cities. So you're looking at developers who are $125 to $250 an hour with minimum project requirements to, to where it's like $18,000 a week. So as a startup entrepreneur in Chattanooga, that's not a bootstrappable thing. Like you just, you can't afford to pay that number. So you're back moving to what are the resources that you can get from a staffing standpoint. And so one of the things that I figured out quickly when I was at Techstars is I was not prepared to be at Techstars to move as fast as I could have been. And so post Techstars, what I did was I, I began writing a book called 101 Ways to Screw Up Your Startup with Much More Colorful Language. Um, and so as part of that, I started noticing a trend. Like when me and Chris were going through Techstars, I, I was like, Chris is so much further ahead of me. And it was like, supremely disheartening for me. We're completely different ideas, completely different markets. We should not be comparing ourselves to each other. However, you know, you're going through the program and you're trying to figure out where you stack up. So one of the things I think that is missing globally from entrepreneurship is a way to know what level your startup is at. So when you talk about access to capital and talk about mentors, There's a lot of times that you'll just be spinning your wheels because you're trying to do something you're not ready for. And so need for assessment is really important. But let's back up to what you're talking about, because I do also want to delve in real fast. I'm going to do a quick yes, no for all of you all for three questions and then delve into a larger conversation. And that is um, what, what you're talking about is recruiting to Chattanooga. If you've got a company and if you're trying to recruit talent, it's not just recruiting to your company, but you've also got to pitch the city. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll just inject real fast. One of the things that I've heard from helping other local companies that are technology uh, focused as they're trying to recruit talent is there's a concern that especially if it's, a, let's say, a technology startup that's raised less than a million dollars. Real world, you don't know if they're going to be around a year, two, three years down the road. That's just the nature of a lot of startups still. Mm -hmm. So the concern is, okay, if I come here from the West Coast or New York or even from around the world to relocate to Chattanooga, can I get a job after my experience here? And between that and also the public education is another component because they'll say, okay, I'm getting paid here in Chattanooga um, a decent amount so I can be comfortable. But if they've got families, that's another area, too. So. Real, real fast, could we just go around and say, is that something that you all have heard as you're trying to recruit at, outside talent from either current experience or past experiences? What have been some of those uh, uh, conversations been like in 30 seconds or less when it comes to recruiting talent? Chris, let's start with you. Um, 30 seconds or less. I haven't necessarily had the experience that Aaron's had. I also think that there's always a balancing skill. So when you're an early stage startup, you have to find individuals that are at the same point in you that can, that can carry the same risk level that you can. And uh, you then have to balance like talent with what you can pay. And that often aligns with where they are in their life as well. Meaning that it's pretty unlikely you're going to be able to find a senior dad that's making, you know, a quarter of a million dollars a year is going to, that's, you know, at that level, it's one going to take a step back. I always think of it more as like you level up as your company grows, like you unlock more capital, you can hire better talent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have personally found Chattanooga to be a rich resource of talent. Um, I, I think that if you, but it's, I mean, it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. You have to be able to tell the story behind what you do and you've got to find people that are young enough again, to be in a position to want to work at a startup and to not have the responsibilities that come with age and families and all those things. Uh, Errol. Um, just to piggyback on what Chris said, I mean, and it's also difficult to compete versus 
you know, some of the upper echelon uh, companies and, and, and organizations inside of the city, you know, just in offering a decent salary um, uh, being from a tech startup. Um, like you said, it's certain uh, certain things that um, individuals have to sacrifice. And it's and it's all all known inside of the startup um, uh, success stories that, that we hear and see on a day to day. Um, but I, I, myself, um, I think the biggest thing for myself is <sighs> let me try to go after Aaron. Let me let me let me let Aaron okay. go for one, one second and, and really. All right, um, Aaron, okay. you're up. So, having worked for kind of one of the largest, especially by headcount, uh, startups in Chattanooga being Freightways, like we saw lots and lots of people trying to get into the opportunities that we were posting and freight waves of course pays some of the best salaries and best benefits in Chattanooga, but you still had lots of talent that was very concerned that if they uprooted their families and they moved to Chattanooga, you know, they're going to have to put their kids in private school, you know, with a lot of the executives that I kind of interacted with, that was a concern is, Oh, well I'm coming here. Schools aren't great. We're coming from somewhere where they're better. Now I've got to look at is private schooling something we're going to have to pay for. Um, and then there is, of course, the big question of what happens when you leave a startup. Freight waves is a weird exception in that they pay really well. But when you look at the similar situation or similar positions within other organizations, whether it be Blue Cross Blue Shield, Unum, TVA, so on and so forth, they don't pay the same rate. And so having worked as both in corporate uh, structures here in Chattanooga, as well as running my own companies and raising capital and so on and so forth. It is a very different understanding of pay scales. Cause when you talk to a lot of the organizations in Chattanooga, they're like, Oh, well the cost of living is not all that expensive here, but what they're like comparing it to is people who have never lived in an Austin where the school system, even the basic school system is exceptional. And then you come here and then there's not as many resources. I mean, I have a special needs child. And so coming back to Chattanooga from Austin was a huge step backwards when it came to the resources that were available to us for educating our children, much less people, you know, who were in Errol's position trying to learn how to code very quickly. They have a need that they've got to address quickly. And then you go through schools and then realize that a lot of the things that they teach are only the things that are applicable to the Blue Crosses, the Unums. They teach technology that is a decade old or at, at best five years old, and they're not teaching kind of the cutting edge stuff that we need to know to be relevant in today's yeah. market. No, absolutely. Errol, do you have anything else to add? And then I'm going to do a, a, a quick survey for you all. Yes, I do. Uh, so what I wanted to wrap my head around was uh, the aspect of the culture of the city. So one of the biggest things that you said of, um, you know, with uh, trying to attract new talent. Um, an example of Atlanta, what makes it easy is the fact that if a business is trying to attract a person, the city does the explaining uh, uh, itself. Um, and, and that's another, that's one thing that um, us as individuals having startups in Chattanooga um, and, you know, myself being a 33 year old African-American look to attract other African-American talent uh, as well as other ethnicities, we want to make sure that that the community, uh, that the city has a culture and experience for them when they when they are here. Um, uh, and that's one thing that that I think um, I've heard a lot about about of that being an issue when it comes to recruiting. But in experience as well, uh, that's one thing that I hope the city uh, uh, really look, looks to pick up on. Well, and, and I'll just to piggyback that. off that, that's a huge thing for us staying in Chattanooga as a family is the cultural differences. Cause when we were in Austin, we, we found our, you know, heartfelt home because you, it's just so open and lots of people talk and there's just a different mindset versus kind of what we have here in Chattanooga. I'll just share real fast after this panel. Um, I'm going to be on another panel with Anton, who's going to be talking about uh, with another group of panelists, how can we, explore branding Chattanooga as a city that is open for more international engagement. So that the idea there being is that like maybe even someday, I mean, it's an idea that's been floating out there 
Uh, there's no official proposal yet, to be clear. But this idea that on top of the innovation district, could there someday be an international district that says, hey, all cultures, all diversity, this is truly a city that everyone is welcome and everyone is really collaborating. And what would that look like? I'm so, going to go around each of you real fast. Um, yeah, and I want you to, yeah, please, Chris. I'm sorry. I was just going to say the one big caveat I would say to all this is that COVID and people working from home, I think, has really changed uh, the the hiring process pretty dramatically to the point where I've noticed over the last year and a half is um, a willingness. And uh, whenever I put a job offer out, I have gotten applications in from all around the world now. Yes. From people wanting to tune in and work from wherever they want to live, right? Because they're going to work from home. And I think that 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 is something that has to be a part of the discussion, that there is uh, talent that typically was living in the Bay that doesn't want to pay the cost and the rent of living in the Bay anymore. So I think that um, who we, like who you can hire and where they live has changed wildly, and that'll be a long-term impact. I, just, I felt like we had to say that. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up. And yeah, and another panel for another time would be talking about, A, when you're launching a company early on, the importance of having people in the same room because that's when you build culture and it's very hard to build culture from the onset virtually rather than when you're in the same room. But, um, but on top of that, I think you're absolutely right. There is a mass exodus happening right now from California, from Illinois, from New York. People are looking for places to go. The real estate market in Chattanooga is booming with not just people, uh, you know, across the country, but like everywhere. And that was even prior to COVID. And now it's even accelerating more. So it's a really interesting time. I want to just go around real fast and ask you all to scale from a, 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 a ranking of one to 10, one being not engaged at all to 10 heavily engaged. So the question is starting with the public sector. How engaged have you all been from the public sector regarding the questions, what can we do to make Chattanooga better for entrepreneurs? Aaron. Um, for me, it's always, it's always a funny story because there was a Forbes article. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, there's a burn here. Um, I'm, I'm going to say probably a three. A, a three out of 10. Chris. I would say for, for us, like a, an eight or a nine out of 10, a lot of our work is with municipalities, um, helping them to engage their visitors, tourists, locals. And we've actually found a, a ton of support uh, from, from the city in a variety of capacities in promoting us and, and, and licensing our technology and helping us in different ways. Um, that's one area that I think Chattanooga has done a, a good job. Um, I, I, I do think that facilitating introductions is something that, that all cities should strive to do and to help be able to open doors uh, that startups struggle to open with. Um, but overall, we've had, I would give an eight. So eight, Errol, one to 10. Um, because of what I, what I know, I would give it around a 7.5. Um, it, 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 um, regardless of where the city is at, I do know where, where uh, a little bit of where Chattanooga is headed. And there are some, uh, some of the things, uh, issues uh, that we brought up. There are, there are uh, a lot of talks around solutions of that going on right now. And so um, I definitely have faith for the future, you know, and, um, um, but right now it's around like 7.5. Very cool. Next question. Uh, same same question, scale from one to 10 from the nonprofit sector. How engaged have you felt from nonprofits here in the community supporting entrepreneurship in terms of getting your thoughts, feedbacks, and proposals for how to improve the community? Uh, let's start with you, Aaron. Uh, probably between the seven and eight. Okay. Chris. Yeah, I would say I would say the same. I think there's a lot of good resources coming from the nonprofit side, um, and uh, yeah, cool. Errol, uh, I will give I will give it a seven. I will give it a seven. Cool, because there, there's a lot more that we can do. And when we when we look at ourselves next to other individuals and diversifying ourselves, it's a lot more that we we have capacity to do. 
And that's the only reason I say that. And then this is a broad question, private sector. So that can include everything, but not limited to, you know, from the, uh, the, lar the larger companies we have in the community to private investment groups. Aaron, one to 10. It's really hard because there's so many different I industries and a number. Um, I'm gonna say that it's low because I just, I can only think of like one or two and I've had zero experience with it. So I don't know that I could even give that an accurate number and to give them something like a one or a two is not really accurate to the situation because I just haven't been exposed. And it varies. Chris? I would say a five, like on the good side. Um, there are a lot of for-profit com companies that donated their time to help startups through CoLab. You know, we ended up with a great relationship with our law firm, uh, Chambliss Bonner. Uh, because of their efforts to be able to help a company get started, and they've really helped us over the years. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that there um, there are a lot of gaps in terms of uh, there should be a better structure of relationships between your big, big private sector companies, your Blue Crosses, your Unums, being involved with the startup scene and helping companies to potentially test new ideas, things like that. And uh, Errol, uh, how about you? Uh, I will say six. Uh, we'll give it around six, yes. Cool, cool. Well, uh, we've got about 10 more minutes left. And so I wanted to um, kind of keep, you know, these last two questions a little bit open-ended. Um, one of the questions is, let's just play a scenario. If money were no object, what's the one thing you would want to bring to Chattanooga to help entrepreneurs like us be more successful? Chris, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I think um, I think improving the public education system for K through 12. So I think that will continue to be a barrier for people moving to Chattanooga who don't want to put their kids in private school. And I think that if you don't have access to good education, uh, as you start to have a family, that becomes just a gigantic red flag. And I think it makes you not competitive with other cities that have invested in the public education system. Errol, how about you? Uh, skill training and more digital education. Aaron. Where would I invest money? Um, graduated investment based on where people have progressed. Because what, what we run into is in, in talking to different people, you have people like Ted who has money, but he's very specific in the things that he invests in. But if we could take a small bit of money from different individuals or organizations and then make it kind of a thing people can graduate into, it would kind of help with the innovation sector, kind of regardless of whether it's entrepreneurship or starting a new restaurant or a new tech startup or something to where there's a a staggered process so that Chattanooga being very unique says, if you want to bring a business here, as you progress through the stages, we're here to support you in multiple ways, starting with financing. I've got a couple more questions for you all, but before I ask that, I would invite everyone who is attending this panel, uh, feel free to use the comments section to the right of your screen and ask questions for the panelists or anything you'd like to see us discuss. Um, and I'm even able to hand the mic over to you as well. So if you'd like to have your video and audio shown, just let us know. Again, in the spirit of this being a public forum, we'd love to bring everybody to the table who would like to be a part of this conversation about how Chattanooga, from both the perspective of the public sector, the private sector, as well as the nonprofit sector, can all step up. Uh, to help entrepreneurs like these three and so many others in our town be successful. Okay, so one another question is for each of you. If you were mayor, what would be an example of a public initiative? This might be something that's never been done before that you think would be a good idea or something that another city has done that really helped is specifically the tech entrepreneurship scene. Um, and then after that, I want to have one more question about uh, COVID and small businesses. But Chris, let's start with you. Yeah, I, uh, this may be controversial. I think the city needs to end and, and should have done this years ago, calling itself the gig city. I think that's something that helped Chattanooga 
a long time ago to create hundred, you know, probably had an impact of hundreds of millions of dollars on the city, but like every city in the world has the gig now. Yeah. And I think that the city, I think that I coming up with an identity for your city is so critical for attracting people to want to be there. And also for those that are living there to feel connected to that mission. So I would want to see Chattanooga rebrand itself with with an evolution of whatever the gig city means. But I, I, I think that that's something that that ship has sailed. It was a fantastic thing for the city of Chattanooga. But the most dangerous thing you can do is to remain complacent and to, to, to get stuck in what, what was successful because the world always changes around you. I don't know what I would do, but I, I, that has been something I have been on a mission about for a while is to say, it's like, we got we to gotta keep moving. Well, and I would just add to that again, you know, after this uh, uh, panel, join us for a conversation around, you know, could potentially uh, a new brand for Chattanooga be that this is one of the most internationally friendly cities in the Southeast. Uh, it's worth having the conversation. Errol. Um, I would love to, uh, I would love to see more uh, innovation funds, um, even if it's uh, kind of like a Southeast thing. You know, because, you know, innovation is the future. We all publicize it, uh, disruption. Uh, everyone markets it. Um, and, and, and I just believe, you know, from the city level, I think that it should be more initiatives towards tech companies, uh, 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 innovation done within uh, tech companies. And I think they should support um, initiatives of that and also reach out to other cities uh, to support as well. Aaron. I'm going to throw a weird one in here. Uh, change the zoning laws to allow smaller structures to be considered homes. Um, mm. We, in the process of starting a tiny house company, we are finding that the 400 square foot limitation for structures in Hamilton County means that every product that we sell, we can't place anywhere in the city. And so what that means is, you know, if you have a parent with a college age student who's attending school here in town and you want to give them a leg up by buying them their own place that they can take with them to go to their future endeavors. You can't put that structure here in town. It also means that for families who don't need a 700 square foot house, who could live in a smaller structure. They can't spend $20,000 to own their home. They've got to spend the $80,000 or more because the housing prices are going up and it's all the old houses are getting bought up and flipped. And so the housing boom is great for people who are building houses and renovating houses, but for people who need to own houses, it's not so great. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to throw in there, at least for me personally, one of the things that um, I've always thought needs to be explored is <clears throat> what are some of the types of economic incentives that we could offer to provide um, specifically innovation arms or R&D facilities for Fortune 1000s to come and locate to downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, I think that's a very important conversation. Um, a client of mine, Mueller, which does a lot of business with the water utility industry, they have an R&D facility downtown that's made a tremendous economic impact. And likewise, you know, there's an opportunity with a lot of empty real estate that we have downtown as well to bring those types of companies. And the advantage of that is that when you look at the data, a lot of those employees that have worked in those sort of innovation arms for five, 10, 15 years or more, once they've got some money saved up, they've got some experience, they've got a lot of interesting connections, they're in a capacity to then jump ship and say, hey, I wanna try a technology startup because I know the industry and I know this space really, really well. It also sort of brings this, this light of a lot of the narrative that we've heard about the innovation district, about it's all about these collision points, right? You've got all these brilliant people that are bumping into each other. So having that also adds something else to the element, but then also the opportunity to have reverse pitch competition. So it's not just having large companies telling entrepreneurs and startups like uh, you know, those and you know, for me and for my clients, to be able to say, hey, if you solve this problem, we will pay you money. Like that's 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 the best thing any entrepreneur can hear is is when that is um, a, a part of the general uh, culture, and that is we we want to help set up entrepreneurs 
for that success. One last question, and that is, um, and then we've got another question here from the audience from Jay Schaefer that I want to get to. But I don't know about you all. I, I've got a fair number of friends who have brick and mortar small businesses. Those might be, you know, coffee shops or restaurants and, uh, you know, and something in manufacturing and everything in between. And let's make no mistake about it. 2020 was a hard year. And one of the things that I've both heard and I've seen is that a lot of cases, despite all this massive federal funding that has been trying to stay funneled through the SBA, through EDIL and PPP and so forth, in a lot of cases, and a growing number of cases, small businesses are saying, no, we're actually going to refuse the money because we don't have a plan for how to make this business profitable in the future, given the current state of COVID and its impact on the economy. So I'm curious if anecdotally, this is a two-folded question. A, you all, are an, you all are an inspiration to, I think, a broader small business community here in Chattanooga, in that there isn't a single small business that exists today that can't, if they're not already thinking about this, to start thinking about what are, what are ways that we can start to digitize our products and services to a larger global market I mean, again, there's another 3 billion people are going to be on the Internet in the next five years. I mean, it's just continuously grows exponentially. So what do those opportunities look like? And two, um, any ideas you have for how the startup community here in Chattanooga can help those types of small businesses uh, make sure that they feel like there's support, not just from the financing side, but also from the consultation and mentoring side to help navigate and think through what those opportunities may look like. Errol, let's start with you. Uh, well, well, and what you were saying, uh, one of the things is one word, hashtag mom. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's one way that um, uh, we, we, we hope to help them um, in, in increasing the transactions and for the local shoppers, the, the experience when actually being able to purchase from them. Um, everything about what you just said was kind of is a, kind of the core to why we invested a lot of our time. Um, brick and motors are still a big, uh, a big part of the revenue that comes in um, um, from from retail. And uh, it will continue, even though it, uh, um, it will change in, in the way it's done. Um, and. I consider myself um, in creating hashtag mall and believing that we haven't done anything new. But what we what we did was we put a lot of things together and packaged it and, and delivered it to the end customer uh, differently than any other commerce company uh, have done. It. Um, and in kind of a way uh, that they would not do it because a lot of them are pay to play and a lot of them would um, like to be char charged first. Uh, for the amenities and, and the things that they'll allow you to do um, um, from them and, and actually uh, and facilitating that purchase for you. And so we believe in, in, in the culture of, you know, um, it should not, first off, it should not be a barrier of entry into, inside of platforms that will help brick and motors excel. Um, yeah. And uh, there should be a flexibility, um, uh, uh, an immense um, emergency of, uh, platforms wanting to provide more flexibility to brick and motors than what they have access to. Um, and with COVID and them needing it more, um, yes, you would drop the dollars if you know your platform is needed, but also there is need of a platform that is, is having a, 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 a more, a easier barrier to actually do the same thing. Um, Chris, any thoughts on this? I mean, when I think brick and mortar, what I think is local. And I think we have to remember that, Local businesses are the heart of the communities that we live in, that local businesses put more money into our communities to provide more jobs to our communities than, than, you know, statistically by far than any of us trying to do a high scale, high growth startup because our chances of success are so small in comparison. Right. Um, I think we have to remember that starting a business is one of the hardest things in the world and we all have to have each other's back and we have to make active decisions every day to shop locally and support those locally uh, versus going and spending more or spending less in a more commercial franchise model that, that may exist. Um, I think we've got to make sure that regulations are there to help small businesses that are in brick and mortar that are trying to survive right now. I think that we have failed 
from a regulatory perspective to have the backs of a lot of restaurants and retail shops by not allowing them opportunities to run their businesses safely in a pandemic. And then um, in terms of, you know, what we can do, I mean, I'm a big believer in trying to get back. I reserve multiple hours a week, every week to try to teach and mentor local uh, local founders who are running brick and mortar that I believe in and to help them. Because I think that while there may be a lot of education around how do you start a startup or do kind of like high scale stuff, for most people, it's just how do I put my products into Shopify or some type of an e-commerce platform and how do I handle the logistics of actually shipping that stuff out? And what does that even look like? What does a paid ad look like? How do I do it? Um, I think that there's there's room for growth there. Uh, Aaron. This is my favorite thing because this is what I spent a whole bunch of time during COVID thinking about. Um, so one, love Errol's product, but one of the problems that we ran into when trying to rethink of what Worley was going to be was how do you figure out what products you even put online? So Errol goes in with his business says, Hey, I want you to put your stuff on hashtag mall that convenience store, small business looks at their entire shop and there's hundreds of items. What, what do I put on there? So what we started looking at was the original Worley plan was to look at recommendations. So now we're taking that a different step in that, during COVID, I did computer repairs for people. And so I could not find parts locally that I knew were here, that I knew people had that they would sell used because they weren't listed anywhere. They weren't on eBay. They weren't on Facebook. There was there was a huge hole. But if there was a good place that I could go ask for a product and say, this is what I was willing to pay, a.k.a. what we used to call one ads, um, it would be great. And so what we've started working on is a way to create that platform and then give that information to small retailers. Cause if we could walk in along with Errol and say, Hey, by the way, there are 73 people that have looked for hot sauce. Um, shout out to Hoff sauce um, in Chattanooga. Is there a percentage of those people that we could convert to buying that art, that product through hashtag mall. And then we tell that retailer, this is the person that you're going to want to sell it to. And we would like to connect you with them. And so that's what has got me super excited about it also because it helps me find parts to be able to repair computers and build tiny houses. Um, the big thing that stinks right now is that Jeff Bezos getting more rich has shown that people have looked at convenience through technology to fill their needs. And they've done that with Amazon. They've done that with Walmart. They've done that with the big shops, the big box stores, because the small retail stores haven't been able to keep up with the technology of convenience. So what I would love to see is something like what Errol's building to be able to be in every shop that's out there. So I could look to see if there's something I could buy locally from a local shop with the convenience that I have with curbside pickup. Well, and I'll also just add to this real fast. I know one of the things in terms of solutions to, to your problem that I, I pitched many years ago, and I hope we can continue to revisit this conversation in our community, is to explore what are ways we can uh, lower the cost to market research tools and resources. So, you know, using um, uh, uh, public resources like the public library, for instance, which is, you know, nationally known as one of the most innovative libraries in the country. Um, because they, they really do their homework and do such a fantastic job of making sure not just that they're on the cutting edge, but that they're the trailblazer and leading the way. How can we start to think about what are the market research tools and insights that entrepreneurs can have access to at a much, much lower cost? Because, you know, for instance, I don't want to make a pitch, but like a lot of my clients are very, very wealthy individuals. They can afford to pay for the latest in consumer psychology, behavioral economics, all of the, the data and the tech out there to understand how people make purchasing decisions. Bootstrapped entrepreneurs don't have access to that information. They don't have access to do those types of studies. And so is there a way we could make that a public resource um, so that if somebody wants to get industry reports as part of their you know, uh, due diligence process or go conduct their own surveys. That's something that they can have access to at a fraction of the cost uh, as well. So we've well, got one of the things that's rough about that, that all that information is great. But as you deal with small business owners, um, 
you, they don't know what they don't know. So there's a lot of that that they don't know how to apply to their business or sure. to understand how to to get the value out of that. So there's an educational component that we also need to give back. And then, you know, we've all seen the Facebook ads for, you know, make videos, learn to do this, uh, become a digital marketing company and make millions of dollars from your home. We literally could create that type of marketing campaign for free resources that are available here in town through organizations. And then that way people could understand the value of the things that you're talking about. Because I think there's just a there's an, an educational gap as to what those things mean to businesses at different levels. It's a piece to the puzzle for sure. I want to get to one last question uh, we have from a gentleman named Jay. He said, how will bottleneck access to capital be affected by remote investing? Does anyone want to take that on as uh, our last question? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is um, a lot of changes happening in the world of investment and finance. I think AR financing, for example, is one of the best things to happen over the last couple of years. And I think it will continue. I'm all to- about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's uh, and and I think that remote investing takes the form of, of several different structures, right? Like there are some institutional investment groups that feel comfortable remote investing. And then there's also, uh, you could do investing through like crowdsourcing and a couple of other means. I think the idea of it is exciting. I think it's still, because it would allow you to be able to build a company wherever you're located, but I think it's still early. I think the question an investor really has to feel comfortable in is, if I invest in you in the place you're choosing to live, do you have the means to grow a successful company there? Right. Like so often the reason a company's had to relocate to invest is because the investor felt like they needed to be in the right city to hire the right talent, to have the right access to potential clients and partners to be successful. And I think it has to be put through that lens of, of can you answer those questions and make make the investor feel comfortable that you can be as successful where you're located? Because ultimately, you've got to be able to give yourself, your company, the greatest chance for success. And a part of that has always been geographically, where are you located? If, if I'm going to invest in you $3 million, can you hire the same talent uh, in the city you're in versus if you were to move to an Atlanta or in Austin? Um, will you find the same partnerships? I think I think that's really the question. But I'd be curious what y'all think. And just real fast, we've got about a minute left, and then I've got to sign off for the next panel. But go you ahead. Want you want me to take it? Uh, super, super fast. It's all about communication. Um, one of the things that's hammered upon us at Techstars is communicate, communicate, communicate. That is not reiter- excuse me, reiterated enough in a lot of the programs that are here locally of how do you communicate with investors, including your customers being your early stage investors. Like that is critically important to remote investors if it's going to be successful. Errol, last word. Uh, I think I think the crowd equity uh, uh, way of investing is the future. And I think it opened the door to a lot of startups that would not have that opportunity if they did not do that. Love it. Guys, thank you so much. This will not be the last time we all get together to talk about this stuff. Um, Chattanooga is a city that we're trying to continue to brand as a city of collaboration, uh, where we're leading not just from the top down, but also from the bottom up. You all are my heroes. Really appreciate you taking the time. And until next time, uh, thanks again, guys. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye.